Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee on Wednesday morning. We are uh, gathered here again to continue our consideration of S-124. And I um, want to just open up for uh, sort of a last call committee discussion this morning about who else you might like to hear from um, and whether you have any uh, any uh, questions or, or need more information uh, related to the parts of the draft that we went over yesterday. Mike Merwicki. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning to the, to the committee. Um, I have to leave in, in a half an hour to go to a Senate committee, so I just wanted to, to chime in that I, I really appreciate uh, the addition of civilians into the, the, the council. Um, as we move forward, I think it's essential uh, that we bring a broader perspective yeah, and that's a good start. So I, I just want to affirm that. I, I support that wholeheartedly and appreciate having that piece in there. Thanks, Mike. It makes the council um, quite a bit larger than it was before. And I know that that's always a bit of a concern um, that the larger the group, the harder it is to, uh, to get things done. But I think uh, the, other, uh, the other opportunity that it raises is for, um, you know, for the council to, to maybe task subgroups with, uh, with doing some legwork and coming back to the whole group, uh, which is probably something that um, can amplify the work that they're doing. Uh, Hal Colston. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, committee. Uh, I just want to echo what Mike shared. Um, I, I heard through our hearings the resounding issue and concern was trust and, and, and the fact that civilians, there's a growing amount of civilians in Vermont who are don't have faith and trust in our law enforcement, and I think this this restructuring of, of this council will will speak really loudly around our our commitment to, to build trust. Thanks, Hal. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Senate GovOps, um, you know, has been taking a look at, at our version of S-124. And um, Senator White um, sent Sarah and I an email yesterday um, with respect to some of the concerns they have. And one, one of the requests um, from Senate GovOps is to retain the um, Commissioner of Corrections and the Correction and Commissioner of Mental Health um, on the Training Council. Um, they, they consider them pretty important persons overseeing mental health services and the argument for corrections is, you know, um, that's sort of the end of the line of the law enforcement process. Um, so that 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 is Senate GovOps's top concern with respect to the bill, as we've um, proposed to amend it to this point. Thanks, John. JP. Um, I actually agreed with that 100 percent. In fact, I wrote that down yesterday um, as a note to follow up on as we proceeded to see if it was ever changed. And I was just curious why they, you know, even took it out, but I kind of thought that was important as well. And um, so, so John, uh, <laughs> I, I agree with the Senate totally on that one. I was going to ask that uh, that get put back in as well, but it's just my two cents on it. Thanks, JP. Jim? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, if uh, Representative Gannon got any insight as to if we added them back in, would they also recommend taking anyone else off or are we just expanding it by two more? 
Um, Senator White didn't have any comment about the size of the training council. Just she thought it was important that those those two members be um, back on the, the council. I, I mean, I do, do, do know that we've heard from a number of members of our committee as well as the public that's a, it, it's important to have public participation. And I know Marsha has, you know, I think we need to do a final count of where we are with respect to members of the public um, and members of law enforcement, um, just to see where we are on that um, and see if everybody's comfortable with the mixture. Yeah, Can, if I may throw out a suggestion, because um, we're into sunsets, um, I'm wondering if I mean, we're, we're expanding the council by a large, to a large degree. And may there be some kind of trigger that um, whether this has been a good change or not a good change in terms of the size and the makeup uh, by reviewing it, say in, I don't know, three years or something. I, I just throw that out as a, Maybe a tickler comes back to us and says, okay, we, we added a lot of different groups and people, um, changed who the chair is. Uh, was that good or should we make further changes? I just throw that out as, as something to consider. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jim. Um, I, I think it is always a good idea to remind ourselves as citizen legislators um, with two year terms. And therefore, uh, sometimes we don't have a lot of uh, institutional memory of what has been done um, to come back and, and look at things again. Uh, Rob, did you have Thank something? you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with a, a lot of what's already been said as far as I, I definitely agree that we need to expand the makeup of the council and certainly get folks on there with different perspectives, especially in today's times. Um, I will say my concern though is uh, I don't wanna see anybody get on that council that's got an agenda. I don't feel that it's appropriate um, for somebody to be on the council that, that has a specific agenda because you're there to do what's best for all. And I still have some concerns about the governor only being able to select from that small group of people as far as who can chair. Um, I'm not sure that I could support that. But I know we still have work left to do. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Other committee members? <clears throat> Bob Hooper, was that a virtual, a yeah, virtual uh, hand? It was an actual hand. Um, I had the same sort of reaction that JP had when corrections, which is essentially the dumping ground for everything that society wants to get rid of, was taken off, I mean, particularly mental health. Um, that's where people end up that have no place else to go and society wants to hide. So that opinion, I think, is valuable on a lot of different venues, this probably being one. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns uh, related to the draft that we looked at yesterday or the issue of adding back in the corrections and mental health commissioners? John Gannon. So um, I, I know Bob raised yesterday and uh, Mike also chimed in on this about the, the social worker being in there. And so when we we're in, when we were in committee yesterday, you know, I looked up team two, um, which is the group that works with law enforcement um, and they reference mental health crisis workers um, in the people who work with the police. And so, um, not that team two is the end of the world or, or knows everything, but you know, that's just a suggestion for modifying that um, given um, that maybe that's a closer match to what we want. 
Um, but I'm open to suggestions on that. That, that was I was just looking and I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Bob Hooper. Um, thank you for that, John. My, after Mike basically corrected my, I've been out of the system too long scenario, um, he's 100% right. But my point was that social worker is a pretty vague term. Um, and you never know what you're going to get. So your, your comment is, is timely, John. Hal? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really like John's thought and maybe the commissioner of mental health appoints such a person, a mental health crisis worker. And I, I'm certainly comfortable with adding back in, in corrections, but I think that would keep the, the parity uh, the same. So it's in the favor of the civilians. Great. <clears throat> so Betsy Ann, can you help us to um, to just take a peek at the at the balance of civilian versus law enforcement if we add both of the commissioners back in? Sure. Hello. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. I was going through and comparing the current membership to the as passed version of S one twenty four. And now to the House GovOps version um, that you're currently considering. Based on your last analysis of who's law enforcement related and who's public related, um, I have right now as the draft 2.1 is currently written, uh, there's a 21 member council with 11 law enforcement related and 10 public related. If you were to add back in um, both the Commissioner of Corrections and the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, if you'll put Commissioner of Corrections under the law enforcement related, and would you put Commissioner of Mental Health under the public related? That would bring you up to um, 12 law enforcement related and 11 public related. Can you, um because I'm <clears throat> juggling too many devices here. Can you just remind us who the appointing uh, authority is for each of the 11 non-law enforcement members? So obviously the commissioner of mental health is um, essentially um, the governor's appointment, but if you could go through the other non-law enforcement members, I think that would be helpful. Absolutely. And if, if anyone wants to follow along, on draft 2.1, the membership of the council is start, uh, starts to be addressed on page two. And so if you want to look at only the public related. Um, is that on the annotated Betsy Ann? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Draft 2.1. The first public related member would be the executive director of racial equity. Then scrolling down to page three, the next one would be an at the bottom of page three, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Center for Crime Victim Services. An individual appointed by the executive director of the Human Rights Commission. An individual appointed by the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence and then six public members who can't have a law enforcement uh, relative or be a law enforcement officer, current legislator, or otherwise be employed in the criminal justice system. And this is where the draft currently breaks it down to be five of, of those six, five would be appointed by the governor. And then one would be jointly elected by the memberships of the Vermont chapters of the NAACP. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very helpful. <clears throat> uh, committee members, any other questions? Committee discussion?
All right. Well, let's uh, let's head back to um, I just just also to let you know I have not other than the other than the the reactions shared by Senator White I have not received um, any other requests for testimony or requests for um, changes to be made I did I did share the um, the draft 2.1 with Representative Donahue because she had been uh, one of the initial sponsors of um, of one of the policing reform bills uh, just so that she could take a look at it and uh, she expressed concern about dropping the Commissioner of Mental Health which uh, we're, we're now taking care of. Um, she also said that she really appreciates the uh, multiple places where people with lived experience uh, with mental health conditions um, uh, are, are added to the bill is, is much appreciated. Um, and she flagged one issue that I don't think we went through in any detail yesterday, um, just related to the health resources allocation plan um, with respect to EMS on page 36, I guess. Um, so I have flagged that for the chair of the healthcare committee um, to make sure that he doesn't have any concerns with that and will hopefully get a, uh, a response back from, uh, from the healthcare committee in short order. I let them know that we're, uh, we are moving towards finishing our work on this bill. Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I maybe I was frozen, but I don't remember uh, on the EMS section of the bill whether or not um, there was any red flags raised by the ambulance services or the Department of Health. Um, I thought everything was pretty smooth sailing, but um, if someone remembers. If there were any flags raised, uh, I'd certainly be interested in listening. Yeah, we did hear from Drew Hazelton um, and uh, Dan Batsy from the Department of Health. Um, I think they testified that they were um, peaceful with the EMS provisions of the bill. Uh, if anyone else wants to go back and review their notes, I would be glad for someone to, to fill us in a little bit on any detailed notes that, that you may have from those two. Yeah, I didn't remember anything and I didn't make any notes that we should look at any particular section, but. It was um, Tuesday the 8th. So if anybody has their notes in um, chronological order, September 8th is when we had that crew in. And I'm just going to flip to that section of the bill so I can take a peek if there were any suggestions that. Uh, so look at alternatives to psychomotor testing was uh, one of the observations that I had written in the margins on this section of the bill. Uh, I'm not sure. Betsy Ann, thank you. <laughs> sure. uh, and those uh, match my notes. I have I believe that was from uh, Professor Patrick Malone. He runs UVM's Rural Emergency Services uh, course. And that psycho, the alternative to psychomotor skills testing is in here. And this language was put in on the Senate side after hearing testimony from uh, Professor Malone that there should be an alternative to the um, national registration and the NREMT's uh, psychomotor skills test. And so that is addressed in here. And my understanding, he was testifying in support of that language, which you can see it starts at the bottom of page 39. Madam Chair? Yes. Could somebody remind me of what psychomotor skills mean in this context? I, I'm drawing a blank, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's in, in regard to 
testing your skills and I think it's in order to maintain your certification. Um, so there's to be licensed to practice here in the state as EMS personnel, you have to get licensed through the Department of Health. And one aspect of licensure is that the individual also has to get a national cert certification from the NREMT, uh, the National Registry of Emergency Med Medical Technicians. And part of the NREMT requirements, they require some of the higher levels of EMS personnel to take this psychomotor skills testing, but for the lower levels, the EMRs, emergency medical responder, or this new um, the emergency medical technician, um, the NREMT national organization will allow flexibility in psychomotor skills testing as I understand it. And Patrick Malone would say it so much more eloquently on the Senate side to describe what it means, but it's basically showing your skills to continue to be uh, certified. And so in, on the national level, they allow flexibility on how to test psychomotor skills. I think it's actually going through the process and hands-on doing things. And so the suggestion from um, you, Patrick, on the Senate side was to allow that flexibility so that there can be on the state level an alternative to just taking the NREMT psychomotor skills testing requirements. So it's basically a, a paramedics or whatever, they have to demonstrate kind of a hands-on ability, maybe, you know, in the field type of scenario. I believe so. I believe okay. that's the case. All right. I thought that's what it was, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hal Colston. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add to that. I'm just reading off of a definition. Um, physical skills such as movement, coordination, manipulation, dexterity, grace, strength, and speed. There you have it. Grace. I love that. <laughs> we don't get tested on our grace here in the legislative realm. But of course, we're very graceful. Marsha. I have a note that says Drew Hazelton said that they could be negatively impacted by this bill, but that's all I have in my notes. So I don't have any more clarification than that. And Betsy Ann does. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, from my notes, uh, when Drew was testifying, he was concerned about dispatch fees, um, that nonprofit EMS will be impacted by DPS dispatch fees. Um, because our nonprofit EMS entities are run through, are, are, they're running on um, fundraising. And so I, my, from my notes, he was saying that um, the potential for DPS to impose those fees um, for dispatch could negatively impact our nonprofit EMS entities that are already struggling. So I think it was a concern about without further action on those fees, um, the fees as currently proposed could be a financial burden. So any other questions from committee members? So I am gonna ask you, Betsy Ann, if you can help me put the public safety planning uh, section of the bill into into context, um, it calls for municipalities to create public safety plans. And I'm just hoping that, that you can help me put this sort of into the context of what, what was already existing in terms of um, towns making um, a public safety plan and then what this bill is proposing to expand on or direct. Sure. So this part of the bill begins on page 46 on line 14. And big picture, it would require each town by, I think it's 2023, by Rep Nowicki, um, to have a public safety plan. Yeah, July 1, 2023, every town would have to have one. And big picture, um, I think the Senate committee was uh, looking at this from uh, for towns 
having knowing what their access to public safety services are, um, regardless of the size of the town. And what this language does is build off of the current annual requirement for each um, local organization, which is a defined term in the emergency management chapter, but each town is supposed to have a local organization for emergency management. And the uh, overall duty of these local organizations for emergency management is to analyze their capability to respond in an emergency all hazards event, um, like, such as a uh, storm, a very big storm, for example. Um, so each town is required to annually analyze what their capabilities are in responding to an all hazards and then feed that information up through the current chains um, of emergency management so that if there is an emergency, um, it's known what emergency services are out there to respond. Um, so you can see if you look through in this section, it's amending the section of Title 20, which is in regard to public safety, the section of public uh, of Title 20 that requires each town to go through this analysis of its um, emergency management capabilities. And if I can find the exact subsection, I will uh, point it out. Okay, so if you turn to page 48 and go to line four, you can see that each local organization is required under current law to annually notify the local emergency planning committee of its capacity to perform emergency functions in response to an all hazard event. So these local organizations are already supposed to be looking at what their capacity is um, as far as could be law enforcement, EMS or fire services in order to respond to emergency. So this new language that begins on page 48 on line 11 would build off of that annual analysis that's already required to happen and uh, require those uh, local organizations to describe um, what their uh, current capacities are in order for the town to have a town plan in order to respond to its normal emergencies. Um, so this language begins by saying, each town and city legislative body, so your select board or your city council, would be required to adopt a public safety plan in accordance with this new subsection that describes how the town or city will address the regular law enforcement, fire and EMS and dispatch resources, needs, scarcities, costs and problems within the municipality unrelated to an all hazards event. Um, and that could look like partnering with one or more other municipalities to address those issues. So the way this would work, it goes on to say on line 18, so concurrently with that annual notification that's required where each uh, local organization is looking at the town's capabilities to respond to an all hazards event. Concurrently with that annual process, each local organization shall analyze the law enforcement, fire, EMS and dispatch resources, needs, scarcities, costs, and problems within the municipalities and report that information to the legislative body. And after the legislative body receives that info, the legislative body would be required to solicit and accept public comment on the current public safety plan. This is in anticipation of each one having one. And consult with um, municipal and regional, regional planning commissions neighboring local organizations and any other relevant um, law enforcement, fire, EMS entities in order to determine how those services may be provided and shared on a regional basis and propose any revisions to their current public safety plan that the bo legislative body deems necessary. And in that case, provide public notice of the proposed revisions or at least public hearing not less than 30 days after it, and then finally adopt any revisions to their current public safety plan. So right now, this is a new thing. Towns don't have, unless they've already taken the initiative to have a, a public safety plan, not all towns have them. So this is, um, this is statutory language in anticipation of when 
this is going to be a requirement for each town to have one. So section, 20, section 24 is a transitional provision to say that each town and city shall undertake the process to adopt a public safety plan so that every town and city has adopted one by July 1, 23. So I'd say this is overall a, a, a just for towns to understand what their um, police, fire, and EMS um, resources are just on a regular everyday basis. And they can determine whether they should be partnering with other regional entities in order to provide those services. Did the Senate hear testimony from uh, either the League or from maybe regional planning commissions about, uh, about any support that might be out there to help towns, maybe super small towns who haven't already created a public safety plan to do one? I just imagine that there are a lot of small towns out there where the same five people serve on many different boards and it would be very challenging to <clears throat> to do this. Yeah, so actually section 25 on line 19 that was deleted is related to that issue. Um, that did provide for, uh, I think it was a total of a $100,000 appropriation to ACCD for a grant program to have, I think it was as proposed at least, um, at least three public safety planning grants um, that would be for the purpose of assisting uh, towns in developing these public safety plans, but that was removed on the uh, Senate appropriation by the by the Senate, or proposed to be removed by the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, so that was one way to address it. Um, okay, well, I can imagine adding a hundred thousand dollar appropriation into this bill would send some people into <coughs> hysterics at this point in the session. Um, but I would like to open up to committee discussion about how we can come back before uh, too long, maybe in the next legislative session and, um, and discuss whether there are some supports that we want to try to create for our smaller municipalities. Um, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. The hand went up before you made that last comment, but it, it's relevant. I, when we talked earlier about what Drew had said and what others have said, and then we roll it into this uh, discussion we're just having, it's clear that we're trying to rely more and more on our towns and municipal governments to provide uh, the backstop for bad things that happen. And in my mind, when we start, everything boils down to money. Uh, when we're continually hearing from people who are involved in this that the dispatch fee is going to impede their ability to either grow or maintain. Uh, it seems like we've got things in here that are counterproductive to each other. And it's just a sort of a knee jerk comment, but uh, I, I am uncomfortable with the discussions we've had with uh, the commissioner about where the money is going and how it's going to be used and uh, that whole fee thing is bothersome to me. Thank you. Well, we did pump the brakes on that uh, with respect to dispatch fees, um, really uh, in my mind for the purpose of making sure that we're, uh, we're not dumping that obligation uh, disproportionately onto the property tax, depending on what municipalities are already doing for, for their dispatch fees. Uh, Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to echo your comments about small rural towns and select boards who are volunteers. In some cases, it's hard to get people to run for a select board because of the time commitment and sometimes they see Montpelier as just throwing one more thing they got to do <clears throat> on their plate um, with no assistance to do it. Uh, so I, um, I, I, but separately from that, maybe a question from Betsy Ann, um, a lot of small communities um, rely on state police for backup service or primary service in many cases. Um, I know our town has a very limited part-time arrangement with a neighboring 
town and using their police department and then it's state police. Um, could a plan be written that said that? Um, you know, we use uh, XYZ police department for, you know, approximately so many hours a week. Um, and beyond that, it's state police. I mean, could, could it say that? Uh, or is this intended to totally remove the state from this um, and just um, do it on your own, which would be a huge burden to many of the communities in rural Vermont? So I think that's possible for a town to say that under its public safety plan, the general uh, description of it on page 48, starting on line 11, it's just how the town or city will address the regular law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch needs within the town. Um, and it just says, which may include partnering with one or more municipalities or entities to address those issues. So it's, it is a quite general description. And if the town, I, I would read it as allowing a town to say, we're going to rely on the VSP for our law enforcement needs, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually spoke to a, a select board member in a small community. We, we talked about this a little bit and I have to say that it raised a lot of concerns. Um, one for me, it, it, this is a, an unfunded mandate coming out of Montpelier. I understand what we're trying to do, but for some communities, this is a really heavy lift. Um, I think Jim or somebody had said, you know, we're, we're having an awful hard time just to get members for say, um, our volunteer fire departments or our volunteer emergency services. And then to throw this sort of administrative stuff on top of it, um, at bare minimum, we would need to get, I believe, a regional um, planning group involved here because a lot of this, um, for instance, a lot of small communities, they do have mutual aid, but it's not really a formal agreement. It's just sort of an unspoken. Um, and I can see that resources are gonna be needed to do this, but I, I have some real concerns about this as far as just dumping this on the, these smaller communities because that there's a lot of work here and expense. Thank you. Betsy Ann, do the regional planning commissions have any, um, any formal um, involvement in regional emergency planning? question I don't know the answer offhand I'm, I'm not sure sorry it seems that we didn't we work on some legislation a few years ago that involved them around this topic madam chair it seems like that there was something around emergency services that was this a part of the bill that was vetoed two years ago that 273 I, I that was before don't. my time on the committee but I know that there are big swaths of this bill that were that were being considered two years ago and were vetoed. I'll check. That, uh, you might be might be more right than wrong on that actually, Madam Chair. I think there was <laughs> always good when I can be a little more right than wrong. <laughs> you notice I said might. I, I okay, yeah. might. Betsy Ann's checking on it for me. Um, Great. Thank you. In the, in the meantime, um, John Gannon. Thanks. Um, you know, R Rob's right. You know, there are, you know, town fire departments already have mutual aid agreements with other towns. I mean, and because at least my area, most of the fire departments are volunteer, um, you know, they often backstop each other almost on a constant basis, depending on what volunteers can show up on at any given incident. Um, so, I mean, that's already in place. I know our local law enforcement agencies um, Wilmington and Dover work with the state police um, and fish and wildlife. Um, I, I'm not really sure what this gets us because, you know, we have to adopt at the select board level now a, an emergency operations plan every year. And it's basically check the box. It's like who, who's in charge and stuff like that. And I just worry this is another check the box thing. Um, 
when the best thing I ever did when I was on, still I'm on the select board, but was participate in a statewide emergency exercise um, several years ago, Vigilant Guard. And I learned more through that process about the, the strengths and weaknesses of um, our local law enforcement, fire, um, rescue. I would like to see something that encourages towns to participate in those exercises because we worked um, in Wyndham County with Guilford um, and a couple other towns and, you know, as well as with the state resources. And there was a state planner, and I think it was in the Department of Public Safety that really worked with us on a regular basis basis that was housed in Brattleboro. Um, and, and that was a good process because we learned a lot about that because they threw everything at us um, and required us to react. Um, I, I just think this is going to be another check the box. So Betsy Ann, any other information on context of where this came from? Yes, so S273 as introduced address this and would have addressed this in a different way. It would have required each town plan to include a public safety plan that includes an analysis of the police, fire, and EMS resources, needs, scarcities, costs, and problems within the municipality. But as I'm recalling the testimony, uh, there were concerns, I think expressed by VLCT, that a town plan is not the appropriate place to address the public safety needs because town plan is more about development and um, the structural um, look of the town and not really at, um, looking at things like this public safety planning. And so I think after hearing, so then that got removed from the bill as passed the Senate. I don't see it in the bill as passed the Senate and I don't believe it got added back through the process. Um, so I think it was, if I'm recalling correctly, it was based on that um, pushback, of the town plan not being an appropriate place for this, that instead, um, the Senate proposed to add this language that you now see in S124 to um, piggyback off of that current annual local emergency planning um, process. Uh, Rob, is your hand up from before? It is, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. No, no worries, just I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to speak if you had something to say. <laughs> I will always watch for your little blue hand, Marcia Gardner. So I believe that there has been conversation over the years about trying to pull together statewide information about emergency services, uh, in particular policing. So I wonder if this part of the bill was intended to pave the way for that. Um, but I agree with my colleagues, uh, this is not a great time to be imposing yet another unfunded mandate upon our towns. Um, but I think at some point it would be good to have an overall view of emergency services for the state. Thank you. Okay, Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe another um, option, I mean, I agree with some of the other sentiments, this is maybe another check the box and what does it really get you? If we want to collect the information, ask the Department of Public Safety to send out a survey, uh, period. Um, and, and maybe kick the time out so we're not doing it right now, but maybe doing it sometime, you know, later next year or even 2022. Um, it, it could be that simple. And if they sense that there's gaps or holes or things that need addressing, they can come bring it back to us. That's certainly one way to uh, to to do that. Um, other thoughts from committee members? John? Um, thank you. Um, I think Jim has a, a 
a good idea there. I mean, having the Department of Public Safety basically develop an inventory of what law enforcement, fire, rescue services are available across the state would be helpful because I think would also serve, serve the state in their emergency planning function to know exactly what resources are available across the state when there is a, um, a major incident such as Tropical Storm Irene um, or something like that so that they know and have contact information for that and doing that on a regular basis just so they know um, how those resources change because I think as we all know volunteer fire departments can be strong in one year and then get lose lose volunteers in another year um, so I think that would be a far better way to address this than the current language in S124. <clears throat> so let's take a close look at what is in this section. And um, other than simply a checkbox of what are you doing for law enforcement, fire, and EMS, um, are there other are the other pieces of information that we think DPS could or should be gathering in in this? Um, in this kind of a survey. Madam Speaker, uh, Chair, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. What can both. I do for you? <laughs> sorry. Um, I have to agree with the member from Wilmington. I would find it very surprising if the state, you know, DPS didn't already have a lot of this information. There may be a question as to how updated it is, but my goodness, that's their job to know what they've got for resources out there. Um, I'd much rather start from where we are and then see where we need to go. And the other thing I was gonna say is I'm also fairly confident that the regional planning commissions would have a lot of this information as well, because I know Washington County here, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, we went through a major discussion about consolidating um, emergency services, fire police, and, and EMS between Barry Montpelier, Barry Town, oh gosh, I think East Montpelier. So I know that there was uh, a lot of research done on that as well. It, so I'm thinking the regional planning commissions would be a good resource or should be. Mm hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. JP. I think uh, Representative LaCroix is exactly correct on this. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but there, there is, this information has already been collected, I believe anyway, at least it was when I was in there. Um, as for the resources available, DPS has access to this regional planning, it has access and, and I'm just wondering if this whole section isn't maybe getting into a little bit of unnecessary duplication of effort, but um, I understand the necessity of it and everything, but I think our EOPs, our emergency operation plans, as Representative Gannon's already mentioned, uh, we uh, select boards put these out. I, th I think we do this every year I, I, and because you have to update it, it's a, it's a, that is a check box form that goes back into the state and and I, again this is important information to know but i think a lot of it's already known and it this may be the duplication of, of effort but but again i'm not sure betsy and maybe you could maybe you could help me on maybe you recall some some other plans i can't remember what it's called but but dps i believe already has the data in, in the input that they've that that's being asked for in this section of, of our current bill we're discussing. I, I could be wrong, but go ahead. I I don't know for certain, but I, I would think so because um, they DPS would take a, the lead role in an emergency um, to be able to call upon emergency resources. So my inference, I don't, while I don't know for certain, my inference is yes, that they would have this information. Well, exactly, because the uh, um, the EOC, the uh, Emergency Operations Center in, in Waterbury, when, the, when they operate, they, you know, everybody gets involved there and, and they, they have all that data in front of them. So the, in the resources that they're, that they can call on, 
and, and I do remember at one point we, we had to um, provide information such as how many, how many police officers do you have? How many cruisers do you have? Are they SUV or four wheel drives, boats, ATVs, uh, equipment, uh, specialized equipment, specialized officers trained in special tactics or different things. And I know we had to do all that. I just can't remember what it was called now, but uh, so I, I, I really think DPS has got a lot of this already or, and I believe they would be to spearhead the uh, the uh, data collection on this too, but I, I wish I could remember what that was called, but anyway, thank you. John Gannon. Um, I just did a quick check and it looks like each regional planning commission has emergency management and actually hosts a round table um, of, of towns with respect to local emergency management. Um, so, I mean, if they're already doing that, this seems a bit dupl duplicative to, to then have every town do basically the same thing, except from town up, finding out what resources are outside the town that can help them. If the local planning commissions, or I should say the county planning commissions are already doing the same thing. Jim. Thank you, Alexa. Go you ahead, know, it's, Jim. It, it's, it's funny. It's definition, is yeah. it? See, Alexa woke up here because someone said Alexa. Alexa, uh, no. I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. <laughs> okay, don't say that. That's right. How do you tell? <laughs> her that you don't need her yeah. to answer you. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much trouble will we get in the Senate if we just strike this section? Just another way to go. I, I, I mean, we duplicate a lot of things and if the regional planning commissions are collecting this data, our, our information, um, why do we need to do it again? So uh, I just throw that well, out there. You know, I guess part of it is the is the act of collecting this information, and the other aspect of this is asking each community to, uh, you know, to create their own uh, plan, their their own uh, emergency response plan in the event that there were um, uh, a major weather event or something. And so, you know, step one inventory what you have and where you go for EMS and fire and police. But step two is then writing a plan for what you would do if we had another tropical storm or if there was a big ice storm or, I mean, lots of cities in the mountains in California right now experiencing um, wildfire events. And with the drought we've had this year, I would say we shouldn't we shouldn't consider ourselves immune to uh, to the possibility of fire. Um, but uh, Marsha Gardner has her hand up. Thank you, uh, Betsy Ann. Can you tell us anything about the discussion that the Senate had around this section? What they had intended to do with this information once it was submitted? I can tell you big picture, I would think it's fair to say that um, Senate GovOps has been focusing on um, whether emergency response or public safety issues should be addressed on a more regional level. Um, since not every town has a local police department and in some cases people who live in rural areas um, are far away from um, access to law enforcement in cases of emergency need. Um, and so I think it was overall just getting towns to think about how they do respond to their just standard public safety needs and whether they need to um, think further about how they'll get law enforcement when they need it ASAP or how they're um, how the citizens of their town will. So I think it was just more 
getting towns to think more about how they address their public safety needs. Thank you. Oh, Betsy. So looking at uh, responding to Representative Palasik's uh, question, I and maybe what you, I'm looking in the emergency management chapter in 20 VSA 32, these local emergency planning committees and one of their current duties, so this is on a town level, um, is one of their duties is to describe local emergency equipment and facilities and the persons responsible for them. Um, so that might be related to what you were describing earlier about um, towns having to identify um, their current resources. Thank, thank you. And I, I think that uh, I knew it was out there. I just couldn't remember what it, what it was called, but I believe that's it. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, Rob. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I can tell you as a former select board member and I don't know a 10 or 12 year member of a volunteer fire department with a fast squad, those issues are always top of mind constantly. Um, it's not one of those things that you just sort of put there and then deal with it when it's in your face. You're always having the conversations about that sort of stuff. Yeah, and it occurs to me as I've watched um, my local towns here respond to the pandemic, which is uh, very different than a, you know, a, a particularly police or fire department um, emergency, but, but yet a, another kind of emergency. It, it has been helpful for, uh, for our communities, not only to sort of have at their fingertips an evaluation of their own resources in town, but then also collaborate across town lines and make sure that um, you know, that neighboring towns also have what they need. So, you know, I, I definitely see the value of having a better inventory of this um, and also prompting towns to, um, you know, to give some thought to what they have for resources. But, but um, you know, I think we need to, we need to be very aware that towns that don't have police forces or only have volunteer fire and EMS um, are, are doing it that way because that's the right size and scope for their community. So um, figuring out how those uh, small departments fit into the, to the quilted landscape of, of all of our emergency response is great and important, but, um, but I think we need to right size what we're asking them to do. So does anybody have a suggestion on how we move forward? I, um, you know, I think that the existing statute that, that is permissive of towns or encouraging towns to, uh, to make an emergency or public safety plan is good. Um, but I guess I would look for, for, uh, some committee discussion on how to give Betsy Ann um, a direction of, of what to, to redraft and bring back to us. So there's a couple different ways I could see us um, moving forward with this. Uh, one would be to push back the date um, or or make it in some way less prescriptive to communities on what they need to do. Another way to do it would be to try to find a way to trigger us to come back and consider whether this is something that we need to have as a funding priority at some point in the future. Uh, funding in order to support the smaller towns who, uh, who have you know, the same five or 10 people who volunteer for every single board um, 
but doing it regionally through planning commissions um, might be might be a model that we could move forward with um, if we uh, if we thought it was important for for there to be something more than just an inventory. So, um, suggestions, questions, comments. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, well, I, I have two, and one is sort of picking up on what you were just going is, is either we strike the whole section or we make all this language apply to the regional planning commissions and have it at least start at that level and see where, where we go. Um, I don't have any doubt that there's going to be some funding requirements here, but I would find that more palatable if we were going to do this, that it started at the regional planning commission level. Great. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, no, I, I agree, Madam Chair, with you and Rob. I, I think, you know, um, changing this language so that it focuses on the regional, regional planning commissions being tasked with this um, and, and push, pushing the date back um, would be um, good ideas um, to incorporate this with the understanding that at some point there may need to be funding um, planning grants um, that are built into this, but acknowledging that that's unlikely um, for the time being given our fiscal constraints. Mm-hmm. JP? You know, I, I really like that idea. I, I think that'll get the, get the uh, intent of what we needed to, to, what they're looking for here and get it done and make it reasonable. If we can task the regional planning commissions to do it, I, I, I think that's a good idea. I like that. And so Betsy Ann, do you um, do you have any quick questions or feedback that you want from us with respect to how we might change this to task the, the RPCs? Yeah, yeah. So right now it's currently written, it's how each town will address the regular law enforcement fire and EMS resources it needs. Um, and so how would you like to describe what the RPCs will do? Is it just to identify within the jurisdiction of the RPCs what those uh, resources currently are? Is it just identifying the resources and so that towns will understand what is out there to potentially be able to rely on those existing resources? Or is it more of a planning for, I guess, what, what, what will they be coming up with? Right. Well, step one is an inventory, right? Um, and uh, and then at some point down the road, if there were a need for a regional plan, um, because obviously we have some towns that have to rely on their neighboring towns um, for mutual aid. And uh, so having a regional plan would make more sense than for instance for West Fairley to say you know this year our volunteer EMS is down to one person who works out of town every day and so we're not going to have XYZ services provided in the town. Um, Rob? Um, I, I actually very much agree with that Madam Chair that part of what you know, you're going to go through, do an assessment where you have resources, but I think the other part of that is you're going to go through and try to understand what the agreements are between communities for mutual aid. For instance, like when I was on Middlesex, um, during the day, depending on what part of the town the issue was, Montpelier was automatically toned out. So I think you need to understand by community what their agreements are with others for mutual aid and that's you know could be from fire to law enforcement um, and certainly for like EMS. Mm -hmm. Marsha? Just a thought but will the regional planning commissions turn right around and ask the towns to provide them with the information that is outlined in already in this bill? 
Uh, so what I'm asking is, will they collect the, the same information that we would be asking for? And does that help the town in any way? Will they still be responsible for collecting all of this information and submitting it just to a different entity? Good question. It's reasonable to think that some of that may happen for sure, but hopefully the regional planning commissions, if our suspicions are correct, should have a fair amount of information already. But there's no question there's gonna be some involvement required from the towns. John Gannon. So um, Chris Campany, who's um, executive director of the Wyndham Regional Planning Commission testified in the Senate um, with respect to these issues. And he would anticipate that the planning commissions would participate um, in this process. Um, so I think heading in that direction um, uh, at least has some support from the testimony that the Senate took. Hmm. Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> Jim, did she wake up? <laughs> I saw you look at her. <laughs> All right, so we have um, we have spent a fair amount of time this morning on uh, on this section of the bill, and I appreciate it because I think that this is an important discussion for us to have. Uh, as we contemplate going back to our own small towns and telling them what we, what grand plans we have made for them. Um, I think what we should do is see if we can, uh, see if we can give Betsy Ann whatever she needs to uh, direct her to redraft this section. And then uh, first thing tomorrow in committee, we should try to hear from at least uh, one regional planning commission to to hear if they have any suggestions on how to make this uh, more workable. So Betsy Ann, anything else you need from us? Feedback. Just one follow-up question is that um, would this be an annual update that the RPCs would need to perform or are you envisioning just uh, a one-time inventory? I think a one-time inventory makes sense. Um, I think that if we want to start thinking more in terms of what I uh, understand the intent of this language to be, which is to to um, to prompt um, a more usable public safety plan in every community, we we need to really understand better what who has the capacity to do a meaningful public safety plan, um, and you know a mosaic of two hundred and fifty little plans might not be as helpful or usable as something that ultimately gets collated and um, and knit together at the regional level. And would they just report this inventory to their affected towns? Yeah. And last question, what do you think the deadline for this should be? Committee, any preference on that? John Gannon. Um, just more thinking about, you know, our, our fiscal state more than anything else. I mean, I, I think that should drive that decision more than anything else about, you know, especially capacity of 
you know, regional planning commissions and, and towns to do this, um, given fiscal constraints that we're going to continue to face because of the COVID-19 emergency. So I, I would support putting this off at least to fiscal year 24, if not 25. Jim Harrison. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, I was going to suggest 23, uh, but 24 is fine too. Anyone else have a strong feeling on a five minute bio break before we come back and um, and do <laughs> see two thumbs up there um, and and do um, another jog through the bill and try at this point to to come back to any details that we didn't get to yesterday, as well as sort of um, uh, you know reassuring ourselves that that we've heard the perspectives we need to on the various sections of the bill. Uh, Warren. Hi. Um... I noticed that Mitzi had uh, the Burlington City Charter and the Barry City Charter on the schedule for today. Um, and I think it's going to go very easily and very quickly, but we haven't really, Bob Hooper and I haven't really discussed. I, I should think he would go first and do the Burlington part and then yield to me and I'll do the Barry City part uh, and, and then announce the committee vote and say, please vote please vote yes. Uh, is that the way you would see us proceeding? I mean, my, re my report is very short. There's not much to the Barry City Charter. Uh, Bob's is a little more involved, but even that's fairly straightforward. I just wanted to mention it before we... So I, yep. Um, I think that sounds like a good plan as far as the floor report goes. And I would, um, I would recommend that you both try to keep your floor reports um, as brief and direct as possible, given the uh, big number of things that we have coming before us on the floor over the next couple of days. Yeah. Um, Sound like a plan? Bob, are you ready for that for this afternoon? <laughs> I think you were just holding up a piece of paper, but it was hard to tell because it was being projected on by your virtual background. Great. Um, five minute bio break brings us back here at 950, 950. Um, turn your camera off and mute yourself and I'll see you in five minutes. Hello and welcome back. How are we doing? All right. I think what we should do now is try to head back to the beginning of the bill and um, knowing that we went through in quite some detail yesterday the uh, the beginning sections of the, the redraft, um, we can go back through that and, um, and also try to get through, I don't know, we've got about 40 minutes, so we may not get through the whole thing. Madam Chair, are we starting where we left off yesterday or are we starting at the beginning again? Betsy Ann, how many changes did we have after the point that we left off yesterday? I am not sure that we had a ton of changes left that we hadn't gotten to, but I could be wrong. We got through the whole bill, or at least uh, there weren't any changes to review in the EMS sections that are in this draft. So we got through all of the uh, potential annotated changes and we discussed, I have a list of maybe about seven or eight different topics for potential revisions next time. I haven't prepared yet a, a revised draft, but um, I can point out some of the, if we want to do more of a high level overview of what's in here now, I can um, just point to some of the potential changes that you discussed yesterday. That would be great. I think we should be driving towards um, trying to see more of a final draft um, for in committee tomorrow. So 
uh, as we go through, we can we can discuss the potential changes and uh, and see more of a clean draft tomorrow. Sounds good. All right. So if if everyone wants to just take a look at draft two point one, the annotated. I will just do more of a high level overview and then, but Madam Chair, just stop me if you want to stop and discuss anything. I'll flag some of the issues that you discussed that are in my notes. Um, I will also try to mention some of the um, things that uh, the Chair of Senate GovOps pointed out too. So it's on your radar. So um, the section one is just discussing the purpose of the council and just updating some of the language. You scroll over to page two, it's adding at the top um, a description of their duty to professionally regulate law enforcement officers in order to maintain statewide standards of officer professional conduct. And also that the council um, in sub C has the authority to approve programs of instruction in addition to just offering them directly. So section two in regard to the council membership is, it's, it's one of those substantive areas um, of this bill. Um, and you've been discussing who should be on it and you got a little bit of feedback from the chair of the Senate committee on their perspectives of uh, removing the potential, uh, potential removal of the commissioners of corrections and mental health. The tentative discussion this morning about adding them back in, or is that where you're at or for the next draft? All things considered, that's what I would recommend that we do. Um, it, it, does, uh, it does make the, the council a bit larger, um, but there are folks who believe that both corrections and mental health um, should have uh, a seat at the table with respect to law enforcement. Okay. So anyone else want to weigh in on that? All right, moving on. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm hearing some feedback that someone might not be muted. All right. Does it sound okay now? Then on page four of the bill, uh, you'd be changing the three mem public members appointed by the governor to six public members. Um, so the governor would appoint five public members um, and you would describe at least two of them. Um, I heard conversations this morning that the right now with the governor appointing one person who would be a social worker on line 10, I heard sounded like a tentative discussion to substitute a mental health crisis worker for social worker. Is that where you're at? Feel free to give a thumbs up. Okay. And the other person with um, a lived experience of having a mental condition or psychiatric disability would be the other specific appointee. Um, and then the sixth public member would be jointly elected by the memberships of the Vermont chapters of the NAACP um, one uh, piece of feedback on that on the Senate uh, in the Senate committee was whether that was workable um, to have a joint election. Rob. I, I, so I have some questions around that. So if, if I read this correctly, then the governor is actually only appointing five people and then the sixth person. Um, what, what does that mean that they would be jointly elected so in other words, the different chapters of the NAACP would elect somebody and then the governor would have to appoint that person? 
Oh, no, it would be the groups together uh, pointing one person. The groups that are the commission is comprised of? Oh, no, I'm I mean, sorry. I, the, the Vermont chapters of the NAACP, I believe there are at least three of them. They would, right. those chapters would jointly elect one member of the council. And then the expectation is that the governor would have to appoint that person. Uh, no, the governor would only be able to appoint the five that That's are currently listed on line nine. Exactly. In addition to the ex officios under the office of governor. Right. So he, he, so he's actually only appointing five and then the sixth the person that's referred to here would be somebody that's elected by the chapters of the NAACP. Yes. Okay. So. Okay. good on how that is currently drafted? I think so, unless unless committee members have a recommendation on. I guess I do have a question about that, Madam Chair. Why wouldn't that position, if that's the way we decide to go, why wouldn't they just be automatically appointed to the commission as opposed to going through this route? I mean, why would they be different than the Human Rights Commission or um, uh, what are the other ones there? Well, functionally, um, the difference that I read in this language is that with respect to the Human Rights Commission, the executive director makes that decision. Um, and with respect to the chapters of the NAACP, it, it, it implies that the membership of the NAACP is electing someone to be the NAACP's appointee to the council. Um, so that implies that there would be a, a bit of a process of people wanting you know, expressing interest in, in serving that function on the Criminal Justice Training Council and then the membership of the groups getting together and, and deciding. But if there is a different way of accomplishing that uh, from the perspective of the NAACP, I would be happy to, um, you know, to hear a suggestion from any of the chapter heads. I don't know that I don't know that Stefan spoke directly to this, um, but perhaps we could get some more feedback if we want to understand how that process might work. Uh, Jim Harrison. Thank you. Is, is it just because there is no Vermont chapter of the, yes. you know, so we couldn't just say uh, the ND and uh, whatever and a NAACP appoints somebody. Correct. There is not one Vermont chapter. There is a Rutland County or Rutland area NAACP. I think it's Rutland area is the official title. There is a Wyndham County NAACP. And then um, those two are on the Secretary of State's Corporations Registry. There's a separate Champlain area NAACP that's been organized. So there's not one overall um, NAACP chapter of Vermont. So if they're not organized, they still, on this language, they would, uh, let's just say, you know, we formed one in Chittenden. Um, would we have to do anything to be part of this vote? I think that it would need to be, I, I, I would think it'd be recognized by the national organization, okay. AACP nationally. Okay. But I, I'm not, I don't know for certain how the uh, bylaws work, for example, if there's any um, to be able to be recognized. I'm not, I'm not certain how that works in practice. Okay. 
but perhaps with further, if you want to just put a hold on this for, for further testimony from a member of the NAACP on workability, um, we can come back and revisit this. Yep, we did have um, we did have testimony from um, from someone on uh, the subcommittee on what was the name of her subcommittee? I can't remember. Um, at any rate, we did have some testimony. We can certainly ask for some more feedback on how the NAACP would propose selecting a member. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm gonna move on in regard to the chair. Um, you can see if you're following along on draft 2.1 on line 16 on page four, I've just got the flag there for you. Because right now the language is that the governor appoints the chair of the council from among the public members that are listed in subdivision A1N and so that is one substantive um, distinction. If you're a public member, you would be able to be a chair, but then also just note down below in subsection C on line 19 that it's only the public members that get the per diem. And so my flagged question for you is, are all of the members that are supposed to be public members appropriately listed under this subdivision A1N? For example, your other public related members is someone who's appointed by the executive director of the Human Rights Commission or uh, the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, so just a flag as, um, as to who should be considered a public member. Um, one qualification to be a public member is that you have to meet those qualifications listed on page four, lines five through eight. You can't have a law enforcement connection or be a legislator or otherwise be employed in the criminal justice system. So that is a qualifier. So just a matter of who appropriately should be under that public member um, qualification. So typically we would want to make sure someone was receiving a per diem for this if they were not already being paid by their employer to be there. For, so for instance, the commissioner of public safety is a part of this by virtue of, of the job description. Um, and so I guess what I am not 100% clear on is how many of those public members might be might be serving in that role because they work for the domestic and sexual violence um, organization, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that goes to that, that per diem question goes to the language that's on page five on lines three to five. So it's per diems as permitted under 32 VSA 1010. And so that 32 VSA 1010 is our standard per diem statute. And it says that you can't get a per diem if you're being paid um, by another entity to attend the meeting, for example. So I think that would cover, um, that would eliminate the ability to be double paid. Okay. Um. So it may, it may require a little reworking of how we define who gets per diems, um, as in not all public members uh, or non-law enforcement members would automatically get a per diem, but some of them might. Uh, Rob LeClaire has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, well, looking at this section, line 16, um, I had expressed some concern about this the other day where I, I do have some great concerns about the governor being limited to only um, appointing the chair of the council from, you know, somebody from the public. So we're automatically saying now that nobody with any sort of law enforcement experience could ever be chair of the council. Um, I'm not saying that that has to be somebody with law enforcement experience, but I, I couldn't support limiting the governor to the point where we'll never have anybody chairing that council with law enforcement experience. I think we, we need to broaden that. John Gannon. Thank you. So addressing the per diem issue first, um, Betsy Ann, if, if we go to page four, 
line 19, which do, do we want to delete that language that the public member set forth in A1 members um, of the council? Does that help solve the per diem issue? Because the Human Rights Commission could appoint a public member, um, the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence could appoint a public member. Um, so I, I just, I mean, if we have the generic language in there. Um, You're right. Um, the Human Rights Commission, for example, could appoint someone who is not going to be paid by the Human Rights Commission to be there. And so if you did remove that language on um, lines 19, at the, basically the bottom of page four, and you can just say, per, um, just keep the language on page five, lines three to five to say, per diem compensation reimbursement of expenses under this subsection shall be made as permitted under 32 VSA 1010, then that would allow per diems for anybody who's not being paid to be there otherwise. And that would automatically eliminate, you know, there would not be authorized to be per diems for the ex officios, for example, because they're already getting their state salary. Okay. So we could delete all that language and just go with the language on page five, um, starting on line three. Yes, I, I think so. Okay. And then, um, Are we, um, because Meta just sent me an email um, with respect to this, are non-public members getting expenses as this is currently drafted? So all, all members of a board under 32 VSA 1010 can get reimbursement of expenses, like your mileage to get there if you're, if you're driving your own car. Even if you're an ex officio, um, you're entitled to get reimbursement of expenses. And so that I can find the specifics. Um, it's a specific subsection of 32 BSA 1010. Okay. I just want to make sure as we head into appropriations that we have <laughs> this language right. Yes. So before we head back into um, Rob's questions about the governor appointing the chair from among the public members of the board. Does anybody want to, does anybody else want to ask a question about per diems, who gets them, what they cover? Um, let's, let's try to close out the per diem conversation and then come back to the members of the council who are from the public, which I think numbers 11, five of whom are appointed by the governor. Um, Hal, are you on chair appointment? Yes. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, you know, my friend from Barry just um, prompted a thought, um, and what what I think is really important to consider is the notion of leadership. Um, I serve on many boards. I'm a boardaholic. I'm on six boards right now. Um, I've served as chair on several, the VNA of Chittenden and Grand Isle County, the largest home health uh, hospice organization in the state. I was the chair. Um, I had no health care, you know, uh, experience. Um, I served on the board of the Howard Center as vice chair, no experience in mental health. Uh, I served on the board of the Vermont Health Foundation, no experience in philanthropy. And, um, and also the Center for Whole Communities, no experience in environmental. But, you know, serving as chair is about leadership. So it's not about, you know, you gotta have law enforcement experience in order to lead a group of community members and law enforcement, you know, officials. So I think it's really about leadership. And I think that's the, um, the quality the governor needs to be looking for in a civilian um, chair of that council. Mike Berwicki. Uh, I wanna affirm what uh, my friend from Winooski has, has shared. Um, as someone who's facilitated enough meetings and, and been 
chair of boards, my experience is a, a good facilitator actually takes themselves out of the meeting as a participant and gives themselves up to having a good meeting happen. So facilitation qualities are the most important thing rather than uh, an experience or interest in the topic at hand. Rob LeClaire. Um, I, I do agree with my friend from Winooski. I mean, it's clearly about his good looks and talent that, that he's gotten all those positions. Um, and I'm not necessarily advocating that it has to be a law enforcement person, but I find limiting it, limiting it to that particular group um, that doesn't allow you to explore the leadership that could be on that council. It's got to be only, I guess, what of the six folks that are there, what happens if you don't have that particular skill set? I just, I don't think we should be limiting the council or the governor to that narrow of an option. The committee discussion? Jim Harrison. What if we went back to the council electing its uh, chair? Um, you, you, you're, we've got a broader, more diverse council. Um, it certainly would, uh, they've got to find a way to work together. So um, maybe, maybe that would be, and if we're going to revisit this, uh, if we do put a caveat in there to revisit this in a couple of years, um, if it, if it didn't play well in the sandbox, we can change it. Other committee discussion? JP? I, I've always kind of uh, preferred that uh, chairs are, are elected by the committees themselves. I think it uh, it gives the uh, committee members a little bit more ownership in, in what's going on and in, in what they're doing there. And, and the committees I've been on in the past and been privy to and everything, the chairs that were elected, I think, actually worked a little bit more effectively than some that may have been appointed. But So I like the election factor of the uh, elect, election of the chair of the committee. So there's going to be 20, I think 23 members they ought to be able to come up with uh, an effective chair, hopefully. Betsy Ann, do you know if the council has in their current um, operating bylaws any restriction against um, someone serving as chair for multiple years? know that they elect them every year, but is that, uh, is that effectively um, a term limit? I don't think that they have that in their, I'm not aware of any bylaws that they have. Um, they do have rules, but I'm not, I don't believe it's uh, that would, that's addressed in their rules. Um, okay. I'm just not certain. All right, any other discussion on this question before we move on? All right, so Betsy Ann, let's uh, just flag that as a area of committee discussion and keep moving. All right. Um, in section three, on page five, there was, there's the current um, proposal to say that the new members have to be appointed by November 15th. I have in my notes um, that one of the House GovOps members raised the question of whether that's enough time to make that appointment. Well, we do have uh, a fair number of um, 
work products that we're asking the council to be involved in that come up fairly quickly. Um, I agree that it could be a little bit challenging, but um, but I guess I would I would err on the side of uh, of asking for this process to begin ASAP, um, just so that the council, as it is newly formed and constituted, is able to get started on the next work products. Committee discussion on that. All right, uh, John Gannon. No, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would agree with you on that. I mean, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done um, and not having the, the council reconstituted would be problematic in I think achieving good results on some of the, the recommendation, recommendations we're seeking from the council. Thanks, Jim Harrison. Yeah, I, I continue to be that committee member with concern um, on the timing. You know, we're talking about a month and a half. Uh, there's also an election in between. Um, I mean, I, I, theoretically, we don't even know who the governor is after uh, November. Um, so uh, I, I would push back uh, that, you know, maybe we give to January 1st or 15th for this appointment. Um, I, I don't like Russian for the sake of filling slots and then putting the wrong people in there. Um, I think more damage can be done than um, with the wrong people. So I would, I would err on a little delay, not a significant delay here. Rob LeClaire. Um, I have to agree with, with Jim. I know that's rare, but um, because this council is so large, there is a lot of different moving pieces here. Um, I would agree. I think that we need to push it back a bit so that we get the right people that have those leadership qualities and people understand what's expected of them. Um, there is a lot going on between now and then, and I, I do think it's a little too rushed. All right. We'll, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, um, Betsy Ann. If it's relevant to your conversation, one of Senator White's um, feedback was wanting to maintain the January 15th report back from the council with the progress report. So I, I, that just seems related to this conversation. So I figured I would mention it here rather than uh, pushing back their first progress report to March. It does. Um, and, you know, as I consider some of the testimony we heard in those three days of public hearings that we held, um, a lot of that testimony was, uh, was coming with a sense of urgency. Um, and I think that there has been a lot of focus and attention on this topic, and I certainly hope that the entities who are tasked with being able to appoint members to a newly constituted uh, criminal justice training council are, are, uh, are already thinking on those terms. And I guess I would be inclined to, to want to try to push for a more, um, a more aggressive timeline, given that we, we need this entity to be uh, joining in with us and giving, uh, giving us their recommendations on how to move forward with some pretty important um, police policy and police reform work in the future. But we'll, we can flag that as another question to come back to. So Betsy Ann, why don't you go ahead and keep us moving. Okay, sounds good. So I'm on page five, section four. This is the requirement for the council to adopt rules to identify other places where people can obtain training. And then on top of page six, um, striving to offer courses, non-overnight courses whenever possible. I think you heard testimony back from the council that they do um, offer courses in different areas of the state and non-overnight courses. Um, however, I'll just note that the 
overnight courses are really in the um, 16 week basic training that's required of law enforcement applicants. Um, so one thing that was struck, stuck out to me was that if you do want to specifically require the council to consider um, non overnight courses during basic training, I think that that language could be potentially um, more designed to address that issue in the council's required report back in section six. Just to note that. So I think the council's essential testimony was we're doing this, what's what's set out in section five, we're already doing that. But I think what my I understood the um, GovOps committees be focusing on in large part was that 16 week residential basic training requirement. Rob LeClaire. Madam Chair. Um, this part here, I have to say, I, I strongly support. I recall taking testimony years ago um, from law enforcement agencies, in particular about the recertifications, that it can be very problematic and expensive for them to have to send their officers down to the academy, where if the instructors could come out and even do it regionally, they there was a lot of support among people for that. And I know that a lot of law enforcement agencies have on-site, um, I guess, trainers that are certified that should be able to meet the criteria that's required for law enforcement for the recertifications as well. But there was a lot of support, I, I would call from law enforcement about not having to always send everybody to the academy. Mm -hmm. Uh, JP. Uh, he is exactly correct in that. It's uh, very time consuming, very expensive to send everybody down there. So what we used to do uh, as much in-service training as we called it uh, by doing it in regional areas, um, we, we sponsor training. I sponsor training uh, in my town. Uh, and sometimes the academy was able to send their staff out. And as we did hear testimony from uh, Cindy Taylor Patch the other day that, that they're, they continue to do that. It is expensive for them to do that. And, um, but it does save the municipalities and uh, quite a lot of time and, and money uh, to send their officers all the way down to Pittsburgh when, when they don't have to. So any, anything we can get for the regional training whether it be for in-service recertification and maybe hopefully in the future, maybe even some basic basic training, it would, would be great. And I'm, and I'm sure everybody, every municipal police department would love that. Well, you do have, and as currently written, you do have the uh, report back in section six, essentially for the new executive director of the council to report to the GovOps committees about the council's plans to replace some of its overnight training with non-overnight training. And um, so maybe at that point, you can get an update on where things are at and then just see if you need to further address it. So maybe that would work as is. Um, I'll just note on, just flagging on page seven, there is that requirement um, starting on July 1, 2021 for a level two officer to be able to transition to level three. And I just flagged for you, the council's feedback was, uh, as I understood it, they're not going to be able to do that without further resources. So I'm just flagging that um, for you in case you wanna do anything further there. Committee discussion. Well, And I'll also, if it's related, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll, I'll just note that, that part of that report back in section six is an, an update on how that restructuring of programs is going. Mm -hmm. so maybe you would have an idea of how things are going at that point. Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I do recall that comment being made, but I don't know if I recall the specifics around why they would need more resources because they're talking primarily about this CLEP. Is that, um, is it that they don't have the ability to go through and, and verify 
the level of training on other things state by state. Yeah, all I have in my notes, it was from the chief, is that for that requirement to go to level two to level three, all I have in my notes is that the council needs more financial resources or staff to make that happen. That's all that I have for details in my notes. Was that Chief Pete? Uh, no, it was Chief Raquel, the chair okay. of the council. Okay. John Gannon. Yeah, yeah, that seemed to be also their issue with issuing waivers is the reason they were taking so long was they didn't have enough staff um, to review, um, you know, non-Vermont um, law enforcement training. I, I mean, it, it concerns me um, given all the, the great work we've done with other professions and trying to, to ease um, people through a process so that we have more professionals in Vermont that, that we don't somehow take a stab at law enforcement and make it easier for people um, to secure either a higher level certification or a waiver um, into the state. Um, and we have limited testimony on this. I'm basically one person. Um, I, I really hope we could do something here given all the good work we've done with respect to other professions. Yes, it is in keeping with uh, with what we are trying to do with other professions, which is to make it uh, easier for people to get to their maximum certification, as well as make it easier for people who have training uh, that they got in some other location to, um, to to get certified or licensed to to practice their profession here in this state. So. Um, I agree that this is something that we should come back to. Um, committee, anyone have thoughts on how to how to move forward with this? Jim Harrison. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I don't ha I don't know uh, what's wrong with the language that we have before us. Um, I I do think. We sometimes, as been said before, we put up obstacles uh, that really aren't necessary. Um, you know, I'll give you a, an example in my area. The Killington police chief is a level two certified law enforcement officer. Now, Killington has a small two person department. And this gentleman's got a young family. Um, with a newborn and, you know, for him to take off and go to another 16 week uh, training program to start all over is just not in the cards um, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, it would take up more than half the department and he'd be gone. Um, this gentleman also went to Norwich where he got some, um, arguably appropriate training uh, for law enforcement. So I, I think we, we do what we can to not put obstacles and say, you gotta start over, much like attracting people from out of state if they have good and appropriate training. I get it that we have to review it. It's not a blank check, um, but you know, let's, let's be open like we are trying to be in so many area, other areas of licensing rather than put obstacles up. So I would encourage us to keep on with this pattern of pushing the envelope to look at it and, and make it easier to get to that next level. We should be incentivizing that, not the status quo. Thank you. I agree. And I also recognize that we are at time. So Betsy Ann, I think we will have to pick up where we have left off. Um, and uh, Jim, I, I very much appreciate what you and John just said about um, uh, about where our focus should be. Uh, Mike Merwicki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering, as the, the clock is ticking louder, 
if uh, there may be the possibility of us having some extended time so we can get this bill done uh, before before the week's end. Yes, what's if your, we need more point? time, we will definitely take it. Um, my intention is for us to, to hear from a couple of different perspectives um, tomorrow and uh, and again, uh, I'm scanning my email inbox and uh, and Andrea is also making sure that she relays any anybody who's expressed an interest in testifying on the bill. Uh, but we will ask for more time if we need it. Um, uh, Betsy Ann, any other burning questions that you would like us to resolve for you before we sign off for the day? Uh, I think I'm good for now. I guess just with next steps, getting a new draft before you. Um, I'll take with the, the comments that you've made so far for the revised draft, but it, it does seem that there's there are still other areas that need to be addressed. Um, responding to some of the um, Senate committee's feedback to as to whether you want to um, address some of their concerns also. So I can work at your direction to come up with make other changes for the committee's consideration if that would be helpful to move things along and we can discuss it again next time if you want to have um, a follow up meeting with me to give me more direction on other changes to make. Okay. Let's plan on doing that and um, and we will aim to put a fresh draft in front of committee members tomorrow. And I've got Andrea reaching out to a few entities for some testimony tomorrow. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, given that we need to present this in appropriations tomorrow, do we want to attempt to get a fiscal note? Um, that suggestion has been made. I think that I think probably makes sense. Hmm? I think we're pretty set on the council, except for how the chair will be appointed, which really doesn't impact an appropriation. No, I think that a fiscal note on that would be helpful. JP? Uh, just real quick on the chair, the question, uh, was posed earlier, can the, the chair of the council serve more than one year? So I, I researched the, uh, the council rules uh, in the between things here and it clearly states that the chair is is uh, elected with the with the uh, one year term and it's it's done on a, on a annual basis, but it does not say anywhere in there whatsoever that I could find that the a Civic person could not serve more than one year as the chair. The, the only thing is the person has to be reelected every year. And it was very clear in that, but it didn't say anything whatsoever about a uh, more than one year. So I, I think that pretty much should answer the question that was proposed earlier. Thank you. Rob? Is the fiscal note just around this question of the council or around all of S-124? Go ahead, John. <laughs> I, I believe the, the concerns that appropriations have raised, um, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, um, deal with the per diems. Oh, okay. okay. I mean, All those right. seem to be appropriations in there. I think dispatch fees is probably something that House Ways and Means will, will also take a look at. Um, but I, I, I don't think there are any other appropriations issues um, in the bill, at least on a quick scan. Well, that study that we talked about this morning, depending on how that gets played out, there could be some, but if it goes the direction I think we're headed, it probably won't need any. Okay, I just got a heads up that Nolan is preparing a fiscal note. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Speedy work, good job. Uh, JP, do you have something? No. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't lower my hand. 
That's all right. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss you. Um, okay, so we uh, we are out of time for today, and uh, I guess we will um, be together on the floor this afternoon. Uh, good luck to Bob and Warren on your floor reports this afternoon. And uh, Betsy and you and I can try to touch base on when we can meet to go through this. Great. You know where to find me if you need me. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your morning. Get some fresh air. See you on the floor later.